In this all-new deluxe edition of the out-of-print gem, readers will discover a new in-universe short story and a never-before-seen introduction, as well as a Barnes & Noble exclusive content featuring a brand new map design and author Q&A. Joining conversation this evening with author and former president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, John Scalzi, please join me in welcoming Victoria B. E. Schwab. You must choose. Right? The various, you know, and I had like two or three different ones to pick. Yeah, you you had the bondage ears, which you wisely chose, right. and the stud ears, and right. you went for bondage. I like right. that. Because I'm already a stud. You are already a stud. <laughs> I'm so sorry I made that joke this early in things. These but, just suit your face really nicely. Thank you, I, and and yours as well. Thank you. Sparkly, Thank you just, very much. just the right way. It's not the only other thing that we have in common because we both also have. Oh, we have our the tour. tour oh, I put the wrong hand up. Yeah, we rings. have our tour rings. These are our wonder twin powers activating here. We, every time we meet in person, it's like a law of the universe that we have to do a little like fist bump. Yeah. Um, exactly. Bringing good science fiction fantasy to you one exactly. ring click at a time. Because in, in point of fact, at this point, we are the uh, only two we are tour the only authors two tour that have, they have the tour rings. Um, we kill them. anyone else who comes along. Right, no, it's, 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 it's sort of there can be only two. Yeah. Sort of thing. And I remember when you got yours, you sent me a picture. Of I did. Like, just I felt go. very powerful because for a while, you were the only one. You were, was, you, you were the Highlander of it a right, little bit. Right, exactly. And I remember um, asking my editor, like, what's a girl got to do like, to get a ring? And they were like, well, if you earn a lot of money for tour and you make us all very happy and you sell a lot of books, we will give you a ring. And then the moment I did my next deal with Tor for like Threads of Power, my, my next uh, series, mm -hmm. the, like I, the very first thing I asked, like there was no congratulations email, there was like, no, I'm so excited. Like first email I sent was like, where's my ring? Where's and they were like, <laughs> they're like, seriously, like everyone who works at Tor for like a year gets this ring, but it's so rare for the authors. Well, it's because authors are, we're, you know, we're itinerant. We come yeah. and go, we go as the publishers go. And the thing is, is that both of us have long-term deals with tour, uh, and I very remember committed relationship. Very committed. <laughs> we are not quite monogamous with tour, no, but you know, but they are our close. primary it's relationship. Close. Yeah. Uh, and I remember what happened with me was because I got that. I got you that, got you got a was it a thirteen book 13 deal? Thirteen book deal. Thirteen book deal. I mean, this is historic, <laughs> like a decade long yeah. thirteen book deal. Yeah, and so. Uh, what happened was is that one of the editors came up to me and they said, normally we don't give them to the authors, but you're going to be around a long time. <laughs> you're stuck. Would you like the ring? And I got the ring and my wife was, she's like, so you only wear two pieces of jewelry, your wedding ring and your wedding ring. <laughs> It's accurate, though. It's accurate. It's well, a commitment. And the, and the same thing with you. Yeah, you it was a commitment. Multi -book, multi -book, I'm yeah. with Tor through like 2023 at this right. point. And I, let's be honest, they're not going to get rid of me anytime right. soon because they can't because I'm just attached to them like a koala. <laughs> <laughs> like, love me. Um, no, it's a commitment. It's really exciting because it, if any of you are aspiring writers or you follow us online, like, you know, this is a hard business. It's a fickle business. And um, th there, we are itinerant. We are freelancers. Right. And, and so I think it's really wonderful. But I am a Slytherin with a very covetous streak. And as soon as I saw you, I was like, I want one too. And I was like, I won't, I don't want to have to displace Scalzi. No. I don't want to have to like become a Highlander, but I'm very okay with being one of two. Right. No, it worked out very well for me. Because the thing is, is that she sent me the picture and she's like, just so you know, I have this. Uh, and you know, and I think that, you know, there was some sort of be like, no, this is supposed to be mine. And I was like, this is so awesome. We're, we're going to totally wonder twins it. But yes, we are agreed that anybody else there. Yeah, I can't. No, I can't allow no, it. That's can't just, allow it's it. already done. We can't, we can't <laughs> so Slytherin. Yes. Really? Hardcore. 
Very, very, very proud Slytherin. I. What I, are you? Do you know? I do know, and it was it was a heartbreaker for me. What are you? Because I thought, I thought for all these years that I was a Ravenclaw, right? Because, oh, no. right, you know, right? Wait, you're feeling my pain here. It's like, of course I'm a Ravenclaw. Did you get Gryffindor? No. <laughs> no. You could not. Every single test I took oh. was like, you're a Gryffindor. And I was in denial. Oh. I was in denial. like, no, I'm a Ravenclaw. I'm, I'm shocked shit. because I like you. And I aggressively <laughs> dislike Gryffindor. I just, you know, and, but the thing is, is that the more I... I thought about it the more I realized yeah. that it's right. Whether I like it or not, I am kind of lawful good. Yeah. And and I and I really am one of those people who's like, you know, oh you you know, it's like, yes, I will be the bulwark against darkness yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and so I had to admit that you it was... You do have an honor streak to I you. Do, I, I do, I do, like... and I hate it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's how you knew that, like, when you didn't have the Highlander moment when I sent you that ring, whereas if I had had the first ring and you sent me a picture, I would have been like, he must die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's a good thing that the Gryffindor came first. Right, no, I think that that's, that, that, that's fair. But like I said, it was like, like my concept of, of myself would be like, you know, you know, one of the snarky kids sitting there, like judging people from afar. Yeah. But no, it turns out that I, I think you can do that too. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you're I, like Ravenclaw rising. Right. Or exactly. <laughs> but it was just, it was just really sort of. It is heartbreaking. Uh, it was, it was heartbreaking. I feel for you. I've never gotten anything but like 98% Slytherin, right. and I don't even try to game the test, right? Because if I were Slytherin, like then I would try to game the test, but I'm just so proud about it. Right, like, like, of course I'm Slytherin, what yeah. else would I be? No, the, the funny thing is, because I was talking about this on the internet, so about, yeah. you know... <laughs> on the how, internet, so you just pointed me like, you know about you that know place. The internet, <laughs> and I, you know, coming out as Gryffindor, I mean, just so you all know, <laughs> I present Gryffindor. Uh, and, uh, and I talked about it, and I was like, and then I mentioned that, you know, my daughter, uh, Athena, is... is so very gladly, Hufflepuff should be like, hell yeah, I'm Puff. Yeah. Once you go Puff, you can't get enough. Or, oh, my goodness. Like that. Uh, and then I mentioned and said also, Chrissy, my wife, hardcore Slytherin because she is super intense, yeah. she's super loyal, and if you cross someone she loves, she will find you and like the Terminator, she will rip out your heart. <laughs> and that, I feel that. And, th and that post was liked by J.K. Rowling. <laughs> so, oh, so I said to Chrissy, I was like, you are canonically yeah. Slytherin <laughs> now. This is, this is the, you have been sorted. Yeah. yeah. So you can't argue about that one way or the other. So. I love that, though. Yeah. People don't think that Slytherins are, like, passionate enough about it. I'm like, I'll bear, like, if, if you hurt a friend of mine, I will bury well, absolutely. you, like, head down <laughs> vertically so it's harder to find your body. Like, right. I have plans for these things, right? I have ideas. Yeah. But I, I, it's an intense loyalty streak. Oh, absolutely. And that's exactly the way Chrissy is. And also the thing is, is if you ever cross a Slytherin, oh, you're, don't do you're it. doomed. Like, this is how I know, like, my marriage will be ended. Like, one day I will drive up to the house and there will be a line of blousers, my wife's family, all with shovels. And as I am pulled <laughs> from the car, the thought in my brain will be, I don't know what it was, but clearly I deserved this. Yeah. <laughs> And then at the next family reunion, people would be like to, to Chrissy, like, didn't you used to be married? I used to, did. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to your husband? Couldn't say. Which is different from I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they all know what happened. They're just Care not, for about our wording, not, aren't we? Like, <laughs> so funny about that. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about your think... book for a minute. Before sure, we sure. Off again, yeah. Yeah. Is that this is why you can't two of us together ever because I just it's fun I know yes, I know yes. we just can't be in real life this is why we're allowed to exist on Twitter well, together, no, but that's the whole, but person, that's the whole right? point it's, it's like because in real life what are we doing we're in a room yeah. and we're typing or avoiding typing one of those two things yeah. uh, and we see humans I don't know what to do with so it. So rarely. I know. So that when we see each other, it's like, oh my god, we have to catch up. But this happened because, like, for a long time I would go on tour and I would talk about what's going to be my next book, but it was several years away. Oh. And so I would do this thing where because I had to live with it and writing is very...
And I would just start telling everyone, like, the entire plot of the book. And my publicist would be in the back of the room, like, stop, I swear to God, you have to stop. And I'd like, but it's so nice to see people's reactions in real life. Like, it's like, there's no, like, floating like buttons and retweets here. Like, I'm feeding off of actual humans. Right, right. Well, the way that I solve that problem is that, so every tour that I do, I do a chapter from an upcoming work, right? Uh, and but basically, I swear everybody for silence to silence, uh, and uh, basically, and because I tell them, it's like you guys actually showed up in the room because you showed up in the room. You get this. Please don't share it with anyone else, but by all means, lord it over them. Yes. Right. And so after my event, I'll see all these tweets. It's like John Scalzi just read from the new book, and I can't tell you anything about it, but it's awesome. I'm glad that they respected that. Though. Yeah. Well, I feel the, like I'm not gonna do that tonight, but that you would respect it if I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I think well, and, and I think. There's two things there. One, uh, if you trust people, they will generally return yes. to us. But the other thing is, they get it. I mean, most of you get it. It's like you showed up, you get something, you made the effort to be here on a school night. I know. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing. I always tell people this, like online, I'll be like, if you come to this event, I will tell you a secret. And then my internet just becomes a lot of people being like, I'm not coming, can you still tell me the secret? I'm like, perhaps no. you don't understand. <laughs> of my secret, is you have to come. And they're like, it's not fair. And I'm like, I didn't say it would be. I'm just <laughs> with, with membership comes privileges. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. No, and that's the way that I always make, you know, that's always my argument, is like, you came out, you yeah. presented yourself, you get something, and people, well, you're not coming to my town. I'm like, eh. there are cars. Exactly. <laughs> There are planes, there are boats, you know. If don't... you were committed, right, I've exactly. been to Canada, they drive for like 10 hours, come right, on. Exactly, <laughs> they make the effort. I know, so right. I live in the UK now, and in the UK, like, they won't drive beyond like 45 minutes, and I'm like, your country's so small, come on. It's the size of Ohio. I was like, in the States, people would drive for four hours to get somewhere, they're like, you could cover all of Scotland in four hours, right. like, they're not going to do it, right? right. It's just, oh, it's crazy. Anyway, so, we've gone off again. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, the Near Witch. Yeah. So I read this on the plane here. Oh, goodness. And uh, I happen. really liked it, and I hate the fact that you wrote it when you were 21. Or it was published when you no, were No, 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 I wrote it when I was 21. Let's, oh. let's not exaggerate. Oh, okay. Let's not <laughs> I wrote it when I was 21. Um, I was second semester senior in college. It yeah. wasn't my first book. Right. Like, I, I had written a book when I was 19. Sure. Very first time I ever tried to write a book. It was genuinely atrocious. Right. As all first books should be. If anyone out there is writing, a first book and you have the audacity for it to be good just stop like don't talk to me right now first books have to suck a bit like they're meant to did you publish your first book are you yes. making that face <laughs> okay for everyone in this room who's not john scalzi like first books are your learning to write a book right. and you did have a lot of craft experience outside of writing novels before oh absolutely novels. i was a i was a working journalist for a number of years and did a lot and and but to your point, yeah. and I agree with it 100%, the very first novel that you ever do, uh, just consider it your practice novel. The, yeah. the task of that book is to write it and to finish it and then look at it and go, what was good about this experience? What was bad about this experience? What have I learned from this experience? Because it's a learning curve. Right. The execution of it is a learning curve, and you get exponentially better, hopefully, yes. between the first book and the second Absolutely. because you're learning. So my first book was... A learning book right but the problem was I started from poetry and so it was actually it was a very pretty novel right. it's a pretty plotless novel so it was pretty enough to get me my first agent sure but thank God it was plotless enough to not sell because in <laughs> retrospect and so I came to a kind of a crisis of faith at, at the ripe old age of 21 because I was second semester senior that first book had gone on to publishers it had gone to acquisitions, which is like the highest point before a book gets spot, four right. times. It was exhausting, and I hit a point of like, okay, I remember clear as day, a, a day in February, a crossroads of, I can either sit down and try again, mm -hmm. or I can go on with my life. And right. maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, I circle back around to this dream that I have, right. and I was very stubborn and very ambitious, and I thought, I'm not going to let that first book be a fluke. It's going to hang over me. And so I checked out from my art studio space for two hours every single night for the entire semester sure. and wrote The Near Witch. And some nights I would write 500 words, and some nights I would write 2,000 words, but I... I did this thing, which I feel like you're trained to do because you come from journalism. You treat it like a job before it pays you like a job. Yeah. So I decided to treat writing like a job. Sure. 
Um, I carved out the time for it, and when I graduated, I had the first draft of the Near Image. Right, and very much the same sort of thing for me, which was uh, having had the experience of journalism, uh, where you always had a deadline and everything had to be in by 3 p.m. on Wednesday, come hell or high water, uh, that uh, I had the experience of being able to just sit down and by muscle memory uh, just get something out. It didn't mean that it was necessarily good. It just meant that do a discipline. Yeah, you had the discipline to, to I had the discipline to sit there and do that. But like I said, so the very first book, I had absolutely no intention for that first book to sell it. You were just so good. How does it feel to have been so good with your first novel? I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, but it. it Ironically, the first book sold after the second book sold, because yeah. the second book was Old Man's War. It was the one where so I had the, had the um, experience and was able to go, what okay. What was the first book? The first book was Agent to the Stars. No way. Yeah. Um, and oh, it's weird, man. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> uh, but, the, so, but the thing for me, though, was like, the whole reason that I wrote the first one yeah. um, was I was, be I was 28, I was about to go back to my 10th high school reunion, <laughs> and I was that kid who had written stuff in high school, and I knew people were going to go, so have you written the novel yet? No. Oh, well. So, right as a motivator. Right, no, exactly. It's just sort of like, so you're like, yeah, I did write the novel as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I did. That's exactly, that's exactly what I did. Um, but I knew that even as I was writing, I was like, I'm not going to sell this. I want to do it just to see what the experience was. And because I had that experience, when it was time for the next one, yeah. like you said with this one, um, what you had and what you learned uh, just came in and was incorporated, yeah. and then you can move forward. And the education of writing, like I, there are a lot of different ways you can you can grow as a writer. But to be honest, like the two for me to this day, the two most important ways that I grow from book to book are in extremely diverse reading, making sure that I have creative yes. cross pollination by reading yes. things I know I will like and everything I don't know, and and in very many industry genres, all of those, and write. Like you have to write something so you can make it better. You have to learn your craft and your voice through the execution of your craft and your voice. You have to write a lot of things which miss the mark, a lot yes. of bad iterations of yourself. Like your voice is a thing which is constantly evolving and growing, mm -hmm. and that grows with each book. And I think you can see the seeds of the writer that I would become in the near witch, yep. but they clearly hadn't they hadn't all found their their state yet. I think one of the things that I always tell people is like first books are like um, like first albums. Yeah. Um, in that, in the first album of whomever it is that you of your favorite band, they're basically somebody else's cover band at that point, right? They have such the influence of whatever music it was that they loved coming in that you can generally track who it was that they loved, and then two or three albums later, they're like, I'm done with that, I've, I've created my own voice and I want to be able to express it. And I found that very much the case with my own published books. I mean, my very first, the very first published book was basically, it's literally is Starship Troopers with old people. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it is. That's why I put Heinlein in the acknowledgments. But 10 years later, Heinlein wouldn't have written Red Shirts, probably wouldn't have written The Collapsing Empire, you know, definitely wouldn't have written Zoe's Tale. So this is really interesting because I was on a panel with an author last year and they quoted, this is like so many steps removed, they quoted a Ray Bradbury introduction to a short story collection. And in this introduction, it's uh, S's for something. I can't remember the, the word that S is for <laughs> because I'm a monster. Um, but in this introduction, Ray Bradbury essentially credits the book to his creative lineage. He says, you know, blank was my father, blank was my mother. Like, he credits different creators and authors for forming him. Yeah. And so, like, I want to know, like, what's your creative lineage? Like, what? who are the authors which made your, like, if your first book is a cover album of the things which were your fomenting agents, you know, the, the creative influences, like, who is who is this creative lineage for you? Okay, I'm going to answer that as long as we get to hear the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Okay, so for me, um, the obvious one for the first one was Heinlein because I literally took the structure of a Heinlein juvenile and put old people in it. Um, but the other thing is, is I tell people, and you made a very cogent point, which is reading widely, yeah. uh, that so much of, where, of, of my formative writers are completely outside of the genre of science fiction and fantasy entirely. For example, um, humorists. 
um, yeah. you know, Elaine May, Robert Benchley, Dorothy Parker, uh, even Mark Twain, the way that they did humor and the way that they did dialogue and the snappy back and forth. I was hugely influenced by dialogue that I uh, heard in films. I was a professional film critic. Marathon Man, uh, people like Ben Hecht, who you know was one of the you know uh, you know uh, back and forth snappy dialogue sort of people. Elaine May, uh, who did The Birdcage and did a rewrite on Tootsie. A lot of that was in there. Uh, crime fiction. Uh, Jeffrey McDonald, whose dialogue was so important for his books that it was actually on the cover of his books. Um, columnists like uh, Mike Royko. Um, and oh, I'm blanking on her name uh, from Texas, and I can't remember her name right now. Texas is a big state. Texas is a big state. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to Molly Ivins uh, and uh, even Dave Barry. Yeah. A lot of these people had nothing to do with science fiction and fantasy, but it's one of the reasons why I think my science and fiction uh, benefited from yeah. it because it's uh, hybrid vigor, to use a biological term, stuff yeah. that people hadn't seen, even as I was advancing tropes that they had definitely seen before. So a lot of those people are my creative lineage. Yeah, I have a theory that I can usually tell when a genre author only reads within the genre that they're writing in because it seems like it becomes a narrower and narrower conversation. You can see that they're pulling from a smaller and smaller pool of influences. So like that's why I call it creative cross-pollination, is that I constantly want to be absorbing ideas and, and and, and tones and, and concepts and just like little seeds from as many, like I read a huge amount yes. of nonfiction, but I had, I had something like, I had a very strange creative upbringing. Uh, I look back at it and like I was Roald Dahl and Shel Silverstein, like I had this very dark, I also grew up on like Baudelaire and William Blake, right? So I had a very strange, morbid, apocalyptic poetry bent. Um, T.H. White. The Once and Future King was hugely, hugely influential to me. Uh, Neil Gaiman, obviously, hugely influential to me. But, and this is like my very, I know it's a little twee, but I have to say, so, so I was not a huge reader. I was an athlete, I spent very little time, like I did not grow up in a library ensconced in books. I wish I had, it's a wonderful, wonderful image that I wish I could co-opt, but I can't. But what I will say is I was a, I was a very, competent reader like I could read but I was that child who was convinced that like if my word if my eyes touched every word then I had read it like I wanted to be taken seriously so badly that I was like my eyes are re reading these words like nothing went in right <laughs> but so I was 11 and um, I was not I had not really found my reading I did boxcar children and that was really the only thing I was doing that and Robert Ludlum again very strange right <laughs> <creative laughs> read and then um, and some of you might have heard me say this before. My mom, one of my mom's close friends called, and she said, "Hey, I, I live in California. Time. I'm in a bookstore in Southern California, and there's a woman here signing books for what look like your daughter's age. Like, would you like me to pick one up for you?" My mom goes, "Oh, my, my daughter's not really a big reader, but uh, sure, like go ahead and get one signed for her. You know, it, it'll make a nice present." And the next week, this book arrives in our house for me, really kind of a non-reader, and it was a signed copy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh. Yes. And so I had this immense generational privilege of being 11 when the first Harry Potter book came out, right? right? This like very specific time where I had one, the first experience ever of forgetting that I was reading. Like that was the first book that made me forget that I had words on a page. Right. It was the first book I saw past it and the movies began playing in my head. But I also had this very weird zeitgeisty experience of growing along with those books, of, have, of being part of the generation for whom more than a decade is dominated by that cultural knowledge, because we had the books, we had the movies. You know, you would walk into a movie theater to see a movie, and the three, like the tones of that instrument would sound, and you would know a trailer was coming. Like everything just like made your heart race for this period. Right. And I'm not sure if it hadn't been for me discovering Harry Potter at that specific time, how long it would have taken me to fall in love with reading. Right. Like I was, I would have been a very competent reader, but I think I probably would have been like chipping away at Dickens at eleven, still just being like, I'm reading it, but right. I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, and I think you make a really interesting point there because I genuinely feel um, that, for better or for worse, however you feel about uh, J.K. Rowling, she is a literally once in a lifetime 
right? Not only for the world that she created, but for the so many people that she influenced. She is she is literally the Beatles. She is literally Picasso, if you want to, you know, or uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, yeah. you know, or Frida Kahlo. She just is is. She was a movement. Yeah, she was. She's gravity, yeah. right, for an entire generation of people, and and one it's. It is exciting because I was I, I'm I'm uh, older Tiny. than you it's just a smidgen. Tiny. So I I aged I was yeah. above the age that um, that those affected me. But you could see just how much it was influencing people and the fact that people are coming out of that um, and creating stuff is is. You know, we live, we live in J.K. Rowling's well, world. We just did 20 minutes on, on which house we were. I know. Well, okay, here's the thing, though. So Slither and me, I have this extraordinary... So I have a terrible memory. I spent so long living in, like, fictional headspaces of my own making that most of my childhood is a little bit blurry. Uh, and I'm an only child. I think that also happens because we create memory in relation to other people, like siblings. And when you don't have siblings, you have less things for the memories to stick to. Totally different conversation. Point being, <laughs> I have this very, very precise memory. I must have been 16 and I'm walking through a park in Nashville, where I lived at the time, and on a bench are two, I, it was right by Vanderbilt, which is a university, and on the bench are two very clearly Vanderbilt professors, right? One's probably in their 40s or 50s, the other one's in their late 60s or 70s, having an intense theological discussion about Harry Potter. <laughs> and this was right after maybe the fourth book had come out, and Slither and me looked at this, I was just starting to find my voice writing, and thought, I want to do that. I want to do something that is powerful enough that it makes people out of the intended audience, whatever that is, have an in-depth conversation about that. Like, I don't know what it was about that moment that I felt such potential for power. And it should be said that, like, this is a similar me. It should be said that my mother had a prophecy run over me before I was born, which is just a very my mother thing. Um, and the thing is, I wasn't allowed to see the prophecy until I was 18, and the only relevant thing about this whole prophecy is that it said that I would either be a writer or a cult leader. Right? <laughs> but the thing I take away about this is the power of words. Yes, that absolutely. They put those two things side by side. Is this idea, and I remember now fusing that piece of information with watching that moment in that park of this, this power that those stories held over an audience to engage in that kind of conversation extra canonically or extra textually. I thought to myself at 16, like, I want that power. The funny thing is, Victoria, have you met your family? <laughs> I feel like it's, it's, it's I've, I found a natural way, right? right? Like, I just like, next time I do an event, I just want to see like more and more cat ears. Like, they're just going to start like popping up throughout right. the exactly. audience, right? right? They just look so good on you. I think we're going to start a movement. There you go. Yeah. Um, you, you all have your marching orders. Yes. Go <laughs> find yourself a pair of cat ears. I can't even tell you where they come from because people, these are only ones that people have given me, so I've never actually found my own. Like, literally, like I said, me. literally, she's like, now you must choose. And I'm now like, you right. choose. Yeah, my, I, I texted my wife, yeah. and she said two things. One, hot. <laughs> <laughs> Always a great thing you want to hear from your wife. And two, she's like, where did you get that? And I was like, they're, I don't know. They're I, think, I think those might belong to you now. I think the ears have chosen you. But I just, like, I get very caught up in the power of words and the power of language. And I, I think not just because I'm a Slytherin, but it, it's something that goes back to my poetry days. And, and it's something which has infused a lot of my books, especially near which is an early work, is the idea of almost the witchcraft of cadence. Yes. The idea of being drawn into a spell with words, of entering a place where you feel like in a slightly different headspace, where you feel like a slight intoxication by the syllables of the words, you know, that. I love that. No, oh, it's a great thing. We need to go into questions yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna. We're just gonna do we, a few of them. But if we don't do your question, questions are things which you can ask when you come up and just chat with us as well, right? right? So you guys had uh, written down questions on yeah, index cards, and so uh, now we're gonna read them. So okay. I want to hear your definition of this first, because this is about how do we define hero and villain? Hero and villain. Hero and villain get defined. Yeah. I want to be the villain. Unless you're in my books, and then yeah. they're like, yeah, sure. Right. You, yeah, you break the curve. Yeah. Uh, but in, uh, but in, in most works, I think most people honestly believe in what they're doing, or at least believe, you know, yeah. that they have cause to do things, uh, and they feel they are doing uh, the right thing. Everyone really does tend to be 
um, the hero of their own uh, of their own story. Even the people who are like, yeah, I'm going to be evil, uh, usually have a reason to do they it. They have a motive. And they have a motive, and they believe that they are righteous for yeah. it. So a lot of just, you know, it's the history of people and whether they are heroes or villains tends to be written by um, victors and outsiders. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, that's, that's what it is. I do think, individually speaking, people need to, I mean, uh, a lot of what makes a hero for me is someone who does the hard thing that is right, um, as opposed to the easy thing that might turn out okay. Um, and that's what makes a hero, that you actually stand up for what you believe for, even if it costs you. But, again, everybody thinks they're doing that. Yeah, it really fascinates me because in Vicious, Victor finds out that he's the villain in everyone else's eyes because the person that he's hunting has been labeled by society a hero. And so he, he talks about this arbitrariness of title. Like, the, like, what does it matter? Like, if you have a person who has the title hero over their head labeled by somebody else who's doing atrocious things, um, then you're okay being the villain. I think I'm, I'm completely uninterested in hero and villain, yeah. and I'm very interested in protagonist and antagonist, yes. right? Because I like antagonism. It's kind of the driving everything that I write about. And I specifically like the transformation from antagonist to protagonist because it really tells you it's all about perspective. Over the course of my books, I'll have somebody who looks like a villain at first glance, very simple. The less you know about a character, the easier it is to label them as the bad guy. Right. And then the more you find out about them, they become, okay, well, this person's interests clearly run counter to my hero, so that makes them the antagonist. But are they a villain? Exactly, they're yeah. not really, right. because it's all it's all perspective, it's all perceptual. This is a thing that continually happens in my books, where I'm like, I need someone to oppose my yeah. you know, protagonist, and I start off writing them to be complete jerk, and then all of a sudden they develop like a code. And I'm like, who gave you permission to do that? <laughs> That's bullshit. How dare you? How dare you? There's only been like really one character who was evil all the way through. Yeah. And he was just a designer. He's like, yeah, I'm a mercenary. I do things for money. <laughs> what do you want? You know, and he yeah. needs a sticky hand, literally, uh, in the Android stream. <laughs> but that's the only one I've ever done. And all the rest of them, all, they get complex on me whether I want them to or not. Yeah, I have two really overt sadists in the Darker Shade of Magic books. <laughs> but I'm convinced that I could still give you Astrid and Athos as Dane's backstory and not make them good. Like, they're not good people. <laughs> but the, every, every character is a product of the actions which and events which made that character like Eli ever and vengeful and vicious is a perfect example of that like and again I, I truly believe the more we learn about a character the harder it is to make yeah. any kind of qualitative judgments about them but really aside from Astra and Athos Dane who I just relish writing sure. a couple like real sadistic twins because who would every now and then you just need a valve right <laughs> uh, let off some steam um, yeah in the in the vast thing I also think that uh, so I guess so many of my books are about the concept that when you give a person power, you make them worse, not better. Because you give them the potential to act on all of their human flaws and grievances. So like I also really fight against the idea of hero because I fight against this idea that when you hand a person power, it also comes with a moral imperative. Like nobody gets like very few people would be handed power and be like, I suddenly feel called to be righteous in like a good selfless servant like helping way right. no like you get hand person power and they're like that person was a dick to me in third grade and i'm going to show them now you know like we have petty grievances we have things which in have you know stuck to us and grudges so i'm also just really interested in like the idea that power is the light and the person is the lampshade like power shows all of the cracks and the power reveals yeah power reveals and i don't think power makes people heroes Oh yeah. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about process because okay. I have a feeling we're very, very different. Though I think you're an outliner, aren't you? Are you a strong? <gasps> no. Okay, this is going to be even better. No. John Scalzi, tell me about your process. <laughs> uh, I sit down and I find out what happened. No, you yeah. do not. I totally do. Did you just make shit up when you sold all those totally books? You're like, I know what happens in this book, and it was just a lie. It was all a lie. There's a lot of tour people here tonight. Make sure you say it nice and loud. Dear tour people. You just, do you not know the endings or anything? No, I will often know what the ending is, but yeah. I don't know how to get there, or I know where I want it to go. But 
No, the thing is, so like when I did this 13 book deal, I didn't intend to do a 13 book deal. I oh, thought yeah. they were going to be like, they would be up by like three or five or something like that. So, but I went in because I over prepared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, then they took them all and I'm like, oh no, I made all those up. Now I'm going to have to actually figure out what all these books are about. Um, and this actually happened. So like, yeah. like the Interdependency series, which is the series that I'm doing now, Collapsing Empire, Consuming Fire. Um, and the next book, which is The Last Emperor, which is being written now, I swear. Yes. <laughs> like right now, just right now, as you're working. I'm going to go back to the hotel and write. Yes, yes. I am. <laughs> uh, it was originally supposed to be a two book series, and one part of the one part was going to cover the entire collapse. It's not a spoiler to, call, to let you know the Empire does collapse. It's really <laughs> it's in the title. Um, so the first book was going to be. The Empire Collapse, and then the second book was going to happen 5,000 years later, oh, or something like that. Uh, and then I started writing, and I'm like, now I'm going to need at least one more book. And then I wrote the second book, and I was like, definitely going to need another book. Uh, and it's going to end on this book. Is it? it, it really Are you is. positive? No, but... Uh, but, uh, but so that it sort of expanded. But so all of these things, I have an idea of how they're... The, the concept of them, which is basically what I yeah. sold. Um, but... Uh, I write the book to find out what happens. Oh God, I'm so jealous. I'm a, I'm a, this was a question was about writing out of order because I, I am a compulsive outliner who then executes out of order. So essentially I write myself a detailed roadmap. I do think that it's key that you do know your ending or you have some idea of it because I actually think this is really key for not quitting because it turns an infinite amount of space into a finite amount of space. Like you now know if you have an idea of your ending that there's a finite, finite amount of space between you and that end. Right. So it becomes like crossing a field instead of a desert. Like you can see something on the other side. But I outline the more books I write, the more neurotic I get about outlining. And I do this because I then, so I like, say I make a detailed outline, but I will then cherry pick whatever scene I feel like writing that day, and then I will write that scene out of order. But when I say I write it out of order, what I actually mean, like I think you think I mean, like that like uh, Ron Swanson moment where he's like, I think you think I said a lot of bacon, but what I really said was give me all your bacon. That was a niche reference. But um, I, I write every sentence in my chapter out of order. Like I will literally dump sentences onto the page like a puzzle with all of the pieces being dumped out. And then I begin assembling them. Like lines of dialogue, pieces of description, moments in the story, like it just comes together like a weird amorphous cloud, like a star explosion in reverse. I get, I'm getting right? it's dizzying. exhausted. It's dizzy. And then it's like, it's like you're holding a lot of it in your head. Now the only exception, the only exception to this is that uh, the Steel Prince, this comic, is, I know I like really shouldn't admit to this. So I'm writing Conjuring of Light and I know I'm gonna reference that like Maxim Rush, the king of Red London, shocker, like had a life before his children. Like this whole series, you've been taught to only think of him as like Kel's adopted father, Rye's parent, largely antagonist. You find out in like one paragraph in book three that he had like a complete life before and that he had this mythic reputation as the Steel Prince. And as I'm writing this scene, I'm like, okay, I just need three things that sound really cool. Like, right. I'm never going to write them, right. so I'm just going to make three sentences. They can be nonsense, garbled, junk, but it has to sound cool, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, the Steel Prince who, you know, defeated the Pirate Queen, the Steel Prince who survived the Night of Knives, and the Steel Prince who tore the heart from the Rebel Army, right? And I'm like, well, I'm never going to touch those again, so at least they sound cool, right? <laughs> and then, I know where this is going. And then Titan was like, hey... Do you want to write a comic about those three things that you said? And I'm like, okay, the first one defeated the pirate queen. Like that one, I can figure that out, right? And then I get to the second one that I clearly chose for syllabolic rhythm alone. The like the steel prince who survived the night of knives. And I'm sitting there staring at it, going, what the hell is that? Like, like what is that? And so I took like a month to be like, what could and like also what could Night of Knives be that you couldn't tell in a single page of a comic, right? It's four issues. It can't just be like the night. Like, what is the night of knives? So it's the only time it's really bitten me for making something up on the spot and then having to expand it. Okay, so you and I have talked very, very big collaborative. Yeah, I know I'm gonna make him one day. And and, and the thing about it is we've got such incompatible styles. <laughs> I mean, I'm not opposed to <laughs> no, the idea of the collaboration, but I don't, I'll be like, here's a chapter, and you're like, great, I'll be cutting it up later tonight. <laughs> 
All right, we, we have space for two more questions. I've been told. Okay, okay, so let's okay. Let's go through them very quickly. Um, okay, let's take the hardest question that ever gets asked. What is your one favorite book ever? Uh, oh man. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna give two: one fiction and one non-fiction. Do it. Do it. So my favorite fiction book is Winter's Tale by Mark Helprin, which. Uh, doesn't hold together as a story, but on a sentence level, it's just so pretty. I, yeah. I, it took me like ten times to actually finish the book because I would get halfway through the book and I would know that I had less than half the book to read and I would just stop yeah. because then I knew it would end. Um, and then I finally finished it and I was like, the story, like I said, the story kind of ends in a uh, okay, <laughs> but every sentence is brilliant. Really? And then nonfiction, um, it's the People's Almanac. Uh, which was, came out in like 1976. I was like six years old when it came out. And I thought that it literally had all the human knowledge in it. <laughs> and I read it cover to cover, which was really, which was great, great in one way and bad in another because I read so much stuff that I had absolutely no context for. Like there was a small dictionary of sex and sex related terms. So I was the only six year old that I knew. It's like, oh, I know what a clitoris is. <laughs> No idea what it's for. <laughs> I know it's what it is. Word. Yes, exactly. Oh, so that's mine. I um, this is hard. Uh, I would say for nonfiction, I read a ton of nonfiction because when I'm writing fantasy, I can't really read right, fantasy. So I'm I'm writing always something. So I have to pick my reading list to not intersect because again, when you write stories completely out of order, it's like really hard to keep that narrative and somebody else's narrative separate, and they, it gets very, very jumbled, and then I don't sleep. Um, there's a nonfiction book that I just want everybody to read, and I don't know if I just found it at the exact right time in my life, because I know that happens sometimes with memoir. It's a book called Lab Girl by Hope Yaren. Lab Girl is, in a lot of ways, a book about a scientist. It's a memoir set um, about a scientist and has a lot of really beautiful like nature information, but on another way, it's a book as an examination of mental health and identity and being lost and like trying to find yourself in relation to the universe. Uh, it is stunning. It was the kind of book where I read it so slowly because I was very sad at the concept of running out of pages. I'm the same with like Jenny Lawson. Like you read those yeah. essays very slowly because you're like, I don't, I am not ready to run out of these again. Like I don't want to do that. Um, picking like a favorite novel of all time is not going to happen. So instead, I'm going to pick one that I love from recently that I think you guys would love as well. Um, I am a really big secret history fan, and in a lot of ways, this book is like a love letter to the secret history, but with, but it's darker, and I kind of like it a little bit more. Um, and it's called If We Were Villains yes. by M. L. Rio. This is like a, a love letter to secret history set at a Shakespearean conservatory, and it is like all of my kinks in one book. <laughs> it is like beautiful writing on a sentence level. It is. It is sexy, it is indulgent, it is dark. So I think that book came out a couple of years ago and it's a book that I'm just kind of like, I think it has very broad appeal. Last question. Oh, okay, this is, I'm gonna cop out on my last question here. Okay. Cause I get asked this at every signing and I'm protecting my heart by answering this question now so you won't ask me in line. It's how is Riley? Um, I have a nine month old puppy, that nine month old puppy that is the coolest animal in the world because she was found at, at four months old wandering the woods of Transylvania, right? She's an actual wild lake. She's a wolfling. Um, and she cannot come with me on tour because I'm going to 12 countries and it would be not kind to a dog to do that even for my own benefit. And so she is staying with my parents in France for three months and she has a much better life than I do. So like this is, this is a spoiled, spoiled situation. So we're all good, but my heart is a little broken. So please don't ask me that one in line. Yeah. I get, I get the, I get that question. You have cats. I might get yes, and Smudge, my Smudge. my uh, new kitten, who we found very similarly. Yeah, right, my daughter thing. stopped to get the mail, and then bounding out of the agricultural oh. field directly south of us comes this kitten. It comes up to her and goes, "Hello, I am your new cat." <laughs> As cats do. As cats do, and we already had three cats, so I didn't want another cat. So I put on the internet, literally. <laughs> Does anybody want this cat? And literally the entire internet was like, no, that is your cat. <laughs> do uh, cats choose? They do, they absolutely do. And uh, and so uh, literally I was, I did a presentation on the boat because mm -hmm. uh, I was on the cruise, the Joko cruise uh, last Woo! week. 
Yes, Samuel, I see you there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so literally the first question was, how is Smudge? And you're like, you're like well, Smudge is, smudge, smudge is adorable and an asshole in equal measures because he's a cat. <laughs> he's this, he, and he knows that he's adorable, yeah. so he's like, oh, look, I am pushing this off. Yeah. And now I'm tilting my head. <laughs> You can't get mad at me. I'm like, I absolutely Aww. can get mad at you. Do you just feel like weird when you're traveling because there's no cat just like sitting? Because I know you're cat furniture, basically. Right, exactly. Like, you're so sure the cat furniture. really just sits right there. It's a, it's a, on one hand, yes, but on the other hand, I also don't have the three o'clock, hey, 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 oh, you're awake. Here's my butt. Uh, which just happens every that is morning. A downside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is a downside. So, Literally on the boat, I slept like eight hours straight every <laughs> single night because I didn't it. have four cats trying to show me their ass. <laughs> so it gives and, and it takes. It and on that, that note. <laughs> on that note, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.